Welcome to uh, Tech Talent Charter's Signatory Forum. Um, a Signatory Forum is essentially an opportunity for us to hear directly from folks who are working on diversity and inclusion in organisations in the real world and to discuss really practical um, points about what we can do on certain issue areas of diversity and inclusion. I'm really pleased today to be able to introduce you to our, um, our guest, which is uh, Beth Tappenden, um, and I'll hand over to her in a second to introduce herself, but to kind of set the tone a little bit here. Um, this signatory forum is looking at LGBTQ plus inclusion throughout the employee career journey. And the reason we wanted to run a signatory forum on this is that we have an estimate from ONS that about 3% of the UK population, um, eight, uh, 16 plus, identify as LGBT. Um, and as a society, there's been lots of discussion and, and points of progress around this. However, there are also areas of um, where we, we're still struggling to kind of find a, a way forward to try and ensure we're being as, as inclusive as possible, especially in the workplace. Um, we know that lots of employers are focusing on this issue area. 66% of our signatories are now looking at diversity and inclusion for LGBTQ plus individuals and folks in their businesses and their networks. Um, and despite this, there can be this approach that can be a little bit like rainbow washing where we only talk about lgbtq plus inclusion during pride month and what we would like to do is try and explore ways that organizations can be inclusive around this issue area not just at one particular time of year but actually looking throughout the entire career journey and the different stages that folks may progress through in their relationship with an employer so i'm going to hand over at this point to beth beth could you please introduce yourself Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Beth Tappenden. I'm an equity, diversity and inclusion professional. Um, I'm in between roles right now. Previously, I was working as a talent provider as an ED&I uh, lead and associate hiring uh, for clients, looking at hiring diverse audiences um, and talent pools, focusing on diversity and equity there, and also helping establishing ED&I practices internally. Uh, and my new role will be focusing on inclusion and well-being um, as an advisor in the legal sector. But predominantly during my time and my career, I've been very heavily involved in recruitment in the tech sector. So I'm really happy to be able to speak to that today and to have worked with the tech talent charter a little bit as well. Uh, so during my time, uh, you know, throughout my career, uh, last of all I have, I sat uh, on a lot of different committees, volunteering as well as my day-to-day -day role around the EDI space. So looking at uh, diversity and inclusion and our MIA committee, uh, working on a number of different projects. And I was also the co-chair for our Pride Network for a year, covering the regions of EMEA, the US and LATAM as well. Uh, a couple of things about my experience, I suppose, so I've been involved in a lot of communities in the UK around LGBT and inclusion in tech in general, specifically in the Manchester area, that's where I'm based. Um, and I also started and founded the Northwest Diversity and Inclusion Meetup. Um, I've worked with organizations like Intertech LGBTQ Plus Forum. I'm currently a committee of um, committee member for Queer in Tech. And I've also been working with boot camps revolving around fostering a diverse workforce within technology as well. Um, so I can give you a little bit uh, you know, of information about where I started and where my sort of passion for this area started. Um, so my passion for diversity and inclusion really started with my master's dissertation in human resource management. And that culminated in a dissertation titled Educating Workforces on Transgender Identities and Transitions. Is your workforce up to date? So I was very happy that this was a sponsored uh, dissertation from Business in the Community and all from DWF, who have been great leaders in this area. Um, and alongside this degree and obviously this fantastic new study, I was able to receive my uh, CIPD level seven as an HR professional. So in terms of my qualifications, that's where it all really started off for me. And that study sparked a lot of interest that I have now as a member of the LGBTQ plus community um, and also as an ally for those with gender queer or gender diverse identities as well. Um, like I said, you know, being a member of the community, I identify as bisexual and queer. I'm very happy speaking about my own personal experience, um, but I understand that not a lot of people are, and it's taken me a long time to get to this space. So that's why I'm very happy to speak about my experience now, um, hoping that it helps, you know, people in the community, allies, um, a host of number of different people. Um, so I suppose in terms of my experience so far, it did start actually and, you know, during and sort of coming out of the pandemic as well, uh, during COVID-19. And that was a very interesting time for DNI as a market, I believe, um, and as part of the people and culture side of businesses. I think there were a lot of movements during this time, Black Lives Matter, um, 
the events surrounding Sarah Everard case and continuing um, social movements such as Me Too that started probably gaining a lot of traction around 2017, just before, but continued throughout this time. And I think a lot of people during the pandemic had time to put more uh, thought and you know, uh, time to think about these social movements, but also what it meant for them, their loved ones, people they knew in their community, and also what they want out of the world of work and what they expect from organizations. So I think organizations during this time were held a lot more accountable on the you know, sort of corporate social responsibility front and a lot of that focused around diversity and inclusion. Um, and what I'm observing now around the space is that there was a big push coming out with the pandemic um, and there seems to be less accountability than there was at the time. If you look at some stats, I, I mentioned Black Lives Matter, I believe it's 82% of the promises made during that time actually went unfulfilled by companies. So it's really important to keep momentum in this space and Tech Talent Charter and like organizations are doing just that. Um, I believe, you know, in terms of business case, it's really important to do this for the people that are in organizations now coming out of the pandemic, like I said, people really understood what they wanted out of the world of work and what they expect in return from their employer. You know, it's a two-way relationship, but it's also a big part of what I would call future-proofing your organization, especially as a younger workforce, specifically um, Gen Z, are really invested in the, I guess, sort of ESG output of organizations that they work for and interact with as customers, as well as the actual work that they do as well. So there is a, you know, a business and a social case to be made here. Um, a lot of you know, cases are out there from the likes of McKinsey, Deloitte, Gallup, um, showing that diversity and inclusion actually you know, equates to high performance, um, a lot of adaptability and being a leading competitor in a lot of markets. Um, and I think there's a lot of untapped uh, sort of strategies and delivery to be done here. So hopefully talking a little bit more about LGBTQ plus Inclusion today will, um, you know, really help spark some conversation in your own organization and will keep the discourse going. Thank you so much, Beth. Um, that's really helpful and super, super thorough and useful to just understand, I guess, the, the areas of experience that you've had, because I'm sure that a lot of those different employee employer areas are, are ones that will, will fall under the remit of the folks on this call. Um, You've spoken to this a little bit already here, but I would love to to get your thoughts initially on um, on some basics, really, because I, know, I think it's always helpful. You mentioned a little bit that you know that there are, there are areas of discomfort around this topic. Um, can we cover some basic terms, if that's okay? Because I think that's always a good place to start. I'm sure a lot of the folks on this call already will have an awareness of this. But um, something that's come up in some of the questions we're hearing are how do we talk about LGBTQ plus inclusion? It, should we even use that acronym? Our company uses something different. You know, how do, we, how do we create language around this that enables people to discuss what we need to be talking about here in a way that enables them to express it, you know, elegantly and, and you know, appropriately and fairly? Um, talk to us a little bit about language. Yeah, definitely. So language is really important and it's something that throughout this space and in the LGBTQ plus space, uh, has evolved over time, definitely. So it's something to be aware of going forward. It's an area that will evolve. So we need to continually be evolving our understanding and our awareness around this. Um, and to really do that is just to keep consistent as my best advice and you know uh, constant sort of within this discourse, you know, make sure you're as involved as possible or just keeping up to date um, with some you know credible sources around what the right language is. So uh, previously, I think the acronym was LGBT. Um, and then the Q plus has been added and there are longer variations of the acronym, LGBTQIA plus, sometimes there's the two in there to represent two spirited people. And a lot of these, you know, account for a lot of different um, identities. So I guess just to cover the basics, the acronym that is most commonly used that I heard of anyway is LGBTQ plus. Um, there can be a couple different meanings for the Q. Um, it can stand for questioning, so someone who is not sure about their identity or going through the phases of figuring out if they might be part of this community. And it can also stand for queer. Now, queer was uh, previously in the 80s um, and 90s used as a slur, but now it is being reclaimed more recently um, and it can be used as an umbrella term for the LGBTQ plus community. So it, it's a, you know, it's a label that I actually identify with and basically it means someone who's not poor, part of the uh, majority in terms of their sexual orientation right. or their gender. So someone who right. might not be heterosexual or might not be cisgender. Um, and essentially what that means um, is 
you know, looking at uh, different minorities that are represented there. And then there's the plus at the end as well. So what that means essentially is looking at, you know, representing all the different identities. So um, LGBTQ are the ones that are probably most common in the um, community, but there are more identities um, that aren't mentioned. You know, if we mentioned all of them, it would be an acronym too long to name. Um, so a couple may be demisexual, agender, asexual, a romantic, two spirited, and really we're trying to capture um, all the other identities that exist out there in that plus to make sure that we're you know giving a nod, nod to them as well, really. Um, and then in terms of you know looking around so, the word, um, can, can I just interrupt and ask a question? So is it still okay to just say LGBT? Yes, yes, I believe it is okay to say LGBT um, to include the Q or the plus. Is, is great as well. Um, usually people will understand what you mean by that. The more inclusive way is to include the Q and the plus, um, but LGBT refers to the community in general. So for me as an individual, I think that's okay, definitely. Thank you. Um, and you mentioned the word community. Um, can I ask you about that as well? Um, with something we've spoken about in the past, can we refer to the LGBTQ plus community as a singular community or is that reductive and does that you know does that actually convey a, an attitude that, that's distasteful to some people yeah so I, it depends on the individual my point of view is that it is a community a number of communities within one umbrella community so like i said words like queer or lgbtq plus they cover anyone who you know is not cisgender and not straight or heterosexual, um, and that comes under one umbrella term as well. But within that, you do have different types of identities and therefore different communities. So you may be able to refer to the lesbian community, the bisexual community, the transgender community, and those people will have different experiences within their own right, within you know the myriad of different identities there. Um, but you can refer to the communities within LGBTQ+, or the LGBTQ plus community as a whole. So it's important to know whether you're addressing the group as a whole or the experience of one type of identity to be able to say that accurately but just to say community as well it, it is um, appropriate when addressing the whole of the queer community. Thanks Beth so I mean we've talked a little bit there about what, what do we mean are we you know how do we want to use our language in a way that's uh, appropriate and sensitive um, but let's go to past that because that's quite surface level and let's look at the kind of the bigger question here. Um, some uh, Devil's advocates may be saying, why should we be caring about LGBTQ plus inclusion? And, you know, I think it's probably truthful and honest to say that there are employees at many of the companies uh, that are, are represented on this call that might be asking this question either in their minds or wondering what's what's all the fuss about and why do we need to focus on this? Why is it worthy of our attention, um, particularly when placed next to other really deep rooted and well-established topics like the shortage of women in tech for example so why should we be mm -hmm. thinking about LG lgbtq plus inclusion still today yeah. you know when there's been so much progress compared to say like the 70s definitely well i think when it comes to uh progress and inclusion in general uh you know those massive milestones they don't just happen by themselves you know people think oh, over time it just gets better but people make those things happen so we need to be proactive in you know creating a more inclusive environment um all around in terms of the tech world uh we look at you know statistics um most recent ones we found from hired.com report that you know eight percent of the tech workers define themselves as lgbtq plus um and that's split from female to male uh looking at non-binary people and different identities within that um you know, with all those different identities, we see that the younger generation is more likely to identify in this way. Um, so my understanding of this essentially is that, you know, in previous generations, we maybe didn't have the language to describe different identities or the same understanding and tolerance that was previous that, you know, is there today. And so we see that a lot of younger people tend to identify in this way. But then also that, like I said, coming out of the pandemic and having different movements going on, there are more people who are coming out and are open. So in terms of inclusion today, ultimately, it's important from two sort of points of view there, and this goes for inclusion across the board, and then we'll get a little bit more into LGBT specifically. So you look at the, the business case and also the social case. So in terms of the business case, like I said before, lots of studies show that businesses are more innovative, adaptable, and they tend to outperform competitors, be top of the market when you have both diversity and inclusion. Now, when you think of uh, diversity and inclusion, a lot of people 
uh, look for sort of a culture fit to what they already have, but we want to change that mindset to think about what can we add to this culture. So, you know, this person, are, are they different from the skill sets that we have already in the team? What kind of experiences do they have that are going to add to producing a product or a service that our customers are going to want to buy? And so we think of this analogy of the perfect toolkit. So if you think about, uh, you know, having a, a problem that you take out your, your toolbox to solve and you've got three hammers, that's great. And they may be different shapes, the size, color, but ultimately they're three hammers and they perform the same function. Whereas if you approach that tool with a hammer, a wrench, a screwdriver, you've got many different ways through which to, to solve that problem, to be innovative. And so that's the kind of analogy around why we think having a diverse and an inclusive workforce is really, um, it's really important and really does drive innovation in the business in general. Now, in terms of LGBTQ plus people um, and, you know, lots of different identities, you know, outside of this as well, in terms of hiring LGBTQ plus people, in terms of your, your market, your product, once you have that psychological safety for people to be able to, you know, sort of put their hand up, add their own ideas in, you might be missing something that they'll be able to see with their own experience. Um, you know, as a member of the community, and that sort of widens your your target audience and who you can reach in terms of an organization. Um, and to be able to do this, you need, you know, both to have the diversity in the room, but you need them to feel included enough to sort of speak up about their experiences and add their own, you know, uh, skill set to, to the product that you're trying to create. So in terms of the business case, it really helps to have a variety of different people in the room, LGBTQ plus people, but LGBTQ plus people from all walks of life who are, um, you know, have different race, disabilities, um, who come from different socioeconomic backgrounds. So it's important to have that intersectional approach as well. In terms of a social movement, um, you know, people, you know, we look at uh, stats around well-being, support, um, performance as well. People tend to perform better overall when they feel safe, when they feel that they're supported and they feel that they're adding value to where they work as well. So in terms of, you know, looking at this, we're seeing better business outcomes from DNI focused around LGBTQ plus people. You can reach more audiences and also your workforce just performs better. They're more motivated, they feel safer and they're able to be more productive in that area. So there's lots of different really angles and areas in which we can work DNI from in general. And looking at LGBTQ plus um, you know the the community there if you're trying to you know involve uh you know one area of the community you're really focusing on including the trans community for example as a bisexual person that's a really big indication that i'll probably be welcome in that space as well so you know while you may be wanting to recognize and you know attract the whole of the community if there's an area that you feel that you need you know more lgbtq plus women in your network and whatnot that's sort of a, a general signal of inclusion for the whole community and also you know goes down really well with people who have members of the community who, um, you know, allies who have loved ones as part of the community as well. It sort of, you know, is a big green flag in terms of attraction um, and looking at recruitment and your talent pool there as well. Brilliant. Thanks, Beth. And you've kind of segued really nicely onto what we'll be spending the rest of this call on, which is digging into all of these different areas of this career life cycle, starting with the attraction and the recruitment um, areas, which you just kind of alluded to a little bit there and how we're positioning ourselves as potential employers of, of talent out there. So um, let's talk about attraction, if that's OK. What, what do we need to know? And I know you've had a long experience in, um, in the talent sector here, so I'm really grateful to be able to pick your brains on this. How do we um, ensure that when we're reaching out to the LGBTQ plus uh, uh, talent in the tech community, um, how are we doing this authentically? How are we making sure that we're also doing it with a sense of focus? What are the secrets to making sure that we're getting this right and not just doing a little bit of um, bare minimum virtue signaling on a job ad, for example? Yeah, yeah, definitely. So, um, I mean, so the, the most important thing for me is um, effectively communicating your signals of inclusion. And this is something I'm going to come back to time and time again over the rest of the call. So um, what I mean by that ultimately is that LGBTQ plus identities, they are invisible a lot of the time. So, you know, you may have, uh, you know, if you see someone and they fit the stereotype of a queer person, you might have a guess, at, you know, that they identify as part of the community, but you can't actually know this for certain unless they disclose this information for you. So what this means is that because uh, these identities are invisible, you need to tell LGBTQ plus people that it's safe to come out and be open in this in an environment, in a workspace before they really feel comfortable to do so. So that's why you really need to be proactive in talking about this space rather than waiting for um, you know, someone to come out or uh, unfortunately for something to go wrong, you don't want to be reacting off the back foot to that. 
So it's really important to be proactive in being vocal and communicating that you are uh, an organization, a team, an individual, that you're happy to support these identities as well. So signals of inclusion are really important, and these can be looking at communicating around things like uh, your pride network, any charity work you do around the LGBTQ plus community, um, looking at policies, making sure they're all gender neutral, are there any LGBT specific ones around family or transitioning, etc. So while this you know, can come from your official voice, if you do have people within your organization, um, people within your network, um, senior leaders and management specifically have a massive impact, it's really great to hear from them as well um, you know, in making a, a voice and you know, helping to add to your employer brand that you are uh, supportive and accepting of the LGBTQ plus community. So, you know, if you don't have any of these things, it's not really the end of the world either. You know, maybe you're uh, waiting to start a Pride Network. There's not maybe the, um, you know, the, the sort of, uh, you know, uh, motivation in your employees or you don't have the, the talent to do that right now. But there are other ways that you can show support as well. So, for example, having pronouns in your email address that just shows support regardless of whether or not you are LGBTQ+. Plus. Um, you know, sort of if you have a, a recruitment call, you know, we are accepting applications from anyone. We are, a, you know, an, an equal uh, employer, but we do specifically welcome uh, I, you know, applications from those who are part of the LGBTQ plus community. Having statements like that, you know, within your recruitment poll um, can be really great for, uh, I, I guess, sort of yeah, being vocal and showing that you are proactively inclusive, um, even if you don't have, you know, all these uh, you know, sort of networks or initiatives just yet, but you can build upon that as well. So it is a bit of, of chicken and egg, you know, having a great uh, retention policy will really help your attraction policy and, you know, uh, sort of goes, you know, both ways, attracting people from the community and hiring them will actually help build up your retention space around LGBTQ plus people as well. Brilliant, thank you so much. And it's, it's something we talked about a bit earlier. We had a question for a registrant for this call um, who said, how do I encourage greater disclosure of LGBTQ plus identity um, in the data I'm collecting for applicants in our talent pool? And the last thing you want is for the first time a, a candidate is, is you know, broaching this subject with you as, an, as a potential employer is to see it on a survey and to have never heard anything else from you about it. Um, it's, a, it's a really great way to get people to not disclose things by, um, making it appear as if it's just coming coming through on a recruitment survey and that's the only thing that you care about. Um, so a really interesting one there and actually um, a really good segue for us to talk about recruitment. So the next stage, you've kind of been messaging out uh, with authenticity and empathy about the fact that you are um, welcoming of folks from the LGBTQ plus community and now you're entering into a recruitment process. What needs to happen in a recruitment process to ensure that it's inclusive for folks from these communities? Yeah, so I think uh, like that remaining open is really important. You know, you don't want to uh, disclose the fact that you might assume something about someone's identity. So uh, my first advice is remaining open and to, to not assume anything, to not assume that you, um, you know, that you can attach a certain identity or label to someone before they disclose this information. So, you know, during the recruitment process, it's a really good opportunity if you do have any of these initiatives. As an employer, you want to sell yourself as much as possible to the candidate, as well as the candidate sort of, you know, looking to give themselves credibility and why they should be uh, a part of your employee base as well. So it's a great opportunity there to speak about the diversity work that you do, um, mentioning, you know, that you have a pride network or that you have transitioning policies or that this is something that you're looking to work on and that you want to um, have more of a focus on in, you know, sort of, you know, the month or next quarter or the years to come is a great way to to sort of signal this in the recruitment process um, in terms of you know making sure that people feel comfortable disclosing this to be you know completely honest this can take quite a long time um, and so you really need to do is have a consistent message when you go out and show the support that you have for the LGBTQ plus community. So a lot of people sometimes will have initiatives on this, but you know, sort of forget almost to communicate this. So it's really important to put that as part of your employer branding and your marketing strategy so it can add to your reputation as an employer over time. I mean, a couple of examples of things that I've done in the past. So I've been part of um, Powering Pride articles where we do sort of a, an interview much like this and then release an article uh, on the company website showing people in the LGBTQ plus community that are part of the network. Um, if you have something, you know, like a webinar, something that you're happy to share or an external speaker come in and do some training, sharing that this is part of your organizational strategy can be really great. 
Um, and if you don't have, you know, the budget to do these sorts of things as well, making statements that you are an LGBTQ plus, um, you know, supportive employer, um, like I said, you know, signals of inclusion wherever you you can get them in are fantastic um, and ultimately in the recruitment process you want to make sure that your interviewers are actually trained not to assume anything about anyone um, and also to think about uh, the experiences of people and what they may have what the support that they may need um, you know sort of going out there and saying you know if we can support you in any way at the beginning and initiating that conversation can go a long way as an employer as well um, I can actually you know give a couple examples of some things sort of uh, you know how this works if that's all right um, so I've had, uh, you know, as, as my time during a recruiter, um, I did have an example actually where, uh, you know, someone was sort of, uh, you know, not assuming that the, the gender of the candidate, but, you know, was hiring for a software developer, interviewing a woman, you know, a candidate that I put in front of them and kept referring to it, the role saying, you know, oh, when we hire this person, he's going to do this and he's going to do that while interviewing a female candidate. So making sure that, that all the language that is used, you know, until the hire is done is gender neutral is really important. Um, and that may seem like an obvious thing, but, you know, slip of the tongue and we need to make sure that we're ingraining these inclusive habits into our day to day as well. Uh, and another one that's more specific to the LGBTQ plus community is thinking about, you know, the environment that people are working in. Um, I actually had a member of the community sort of disclose to me an experience that they had that I thought was quite interesting, um, where they were going for a tech consulting job. Um, this required some travel and they said, you know, with this contract, we want to let you know that we reserve the right to, you know, have you work in any of our offices, you know, if you sign on to a project, you may have to change location. Uh, this was fine for the member of the community um, until they realized that maybe they wouldn't feel so safe in some of the locations that they were asking this person to go. And so that was something that, you know, was, didn't put them off the roll completely, but something they had to have a conversation, um, you know, with, with their supervisor later on. So making sure that you're thinking about, you know, if we are sort of asking people to do things, are we asking them in, in ways that are inclusive and are safe for them um, and having, you know, sort of a you know, uh, initiating conversations, you know, saying, is this okay with you? Is there any more support that we can give? Um, and knowing people, letting people know that you are flexible around this can be a really big uh, help to people as well, especially when looking at recruitment um, and also the details of getting someone onboarded and starting a good relationship. I think that's such an important thing that you're just mentioning there, Beth, about the idea of um, helping people feel safe from, from the offing, because you could have people self-selecting themselves out of recruitment processes because you're saying there is an expectation of travel. And if they know you've got offices okay. in parts of the world where there is very open anti-LGBTQ plus legislation or um, social expectations, that is enough for someone to rule themselves out of a position completely. And we're not even necessarily talking super far afield. There are places in Europe, for example, where there are these movements against LGBTQ plus um, inclusion. And so we have to be really mindful of um, expressing that up front because people could be ruling themselves out immediately without you even noticing that that's crossed their mind. Because if you if you're part of a majority group, it's not necessarily going to be top of your mind of do I feel safe to go and do some business travel. Um, there are some really interesting examples as well of, of um, embassy policies, which I'm sure you you know of Beth as well. And the idea of having every office being an embassy, essentially a safe space for that person to travel to, irrespective of the, the kind of uh, the culture, at least. I mean, it's not the same for legislation, but certainly for the culture. Um, it's treated as a safe space and there's some um, I think good examples from EY if you want to look up look up that um it's uh, I believe it's EY who have got a, a post about um having each of their offices act as an embassy so it could be something to look at there so we've gone through this recruitment process and hopefully we're identifying some of these potential um issue areas that we might not have thought through before um let's say we make an offer to someone for a role um then comes the onboarding period what do we need to be thinking about there to ensure that onboarding is successful? Because obviously this is one of the places where you really set the tone for the relationship between the employer and the employee. And it could have a really long tail as to how that affects the relationship and their retention progression moving forward. So what do we need to be thinking about to make sure that this really important transition period of onboarding is successful for folks from the LGBTQ plus community? Well, essentially with onboarding, I think the most important thing here, like you said, it's setting up a good relationship and this will really inform um, the, well inform the working life of this employee going forward so essentially like I said before you want to make sure we're keeping everything as inclusive as possible um, but give this person options about you know what they can and can't be involved with and so flagging support for people of different identities is really important so um, you know 
introducing people to the range of options that you have in terms of support. Uh, do you have any pride networks? Do you have policies that they can make use of? If they have a family, what might considerations might they have if they are in a same sex relationship or if they are looking at potentially transitioning or if they're in the middle of a transition? So you need to think about the different ways, um, making everything, you know, sort of accessible to everyone ultimately, um, but then thinking about those specific situations where you may need a policy that doesn't apply to everyone, that applies to someone in a specific situation or with a specific identity. So a couple areas to think about there, um, networks and support in general for, um, you know, well-being support, mental health, um, looking at healthcare policies and anything that extends to someone's partner, um, whether that's, you know, uh, a heterosexual relationship or a same-sex relationship and thinking about diverse gender as well, different considerations. Do you have a, a transitioning at work policy? Do you have a procedure and are your management and are your HR team, you know, trained in how to use that? So these can be all really important things to introduce to onboarding, uh, not necessarily to sort of uh, flag, say, oh, uh, you're a bisexual woman, I'm going to tell you all the different things you have, but making sure they know what's accessible and how to access it is really, really important. And then as well, um, you know, if someone is asking for support off, you know, off the back of a conversation that you've had at onboarding or in the interview stage, letting this person sort of lead the conversation and knowing what they want from you. So if you've given them all the options, it's then up to them to sort of make use of them. You just need to let people know what is available and what support you can offer them as a company, as an HR team and as a line manager as well. So can I ask something about um, the cadence of which we're asking or, or presenting these these um, options and support networks? How much should we be doing it? Because on the one hand, you don't want to be assuming someone's identity about them. On the other hand, mm -hmm. um, you'll have folks that are saying, oh, well, I was only asked about this once and then my, my manager never asked me about it again and I never knew how to get the support from them. So how, how do you, in your experience, what's the right kind of cadence to be bringing this up and creating these opportunities without overstepping? Yeah, yeah, definitely. So I think in terms of, I mean, if you think in terms of retention, it's always good to give people a reminder um, and people as well when they're, you know, being onboarded into a new role. Um, there's a lot of new information to take in all at once. They may need reminders, you know, not just introducing it to them the once, um, but, you know, again, throughout the employee life cycle as well. So I would say it's great to mention it. You know, you hope that people see something about this in your attraction and sourcing strategy, that it's information that they're aware about and, you know, uh, something that you offer. Uh, if it comes up in the interview or just letting people know about the support that is available to them as an employee, that's a great attraction point as well, regardless of how someone identifies. Um, we're thinking about onboarding, the support that they have, resources you can access. It's important information to flag then, especially that they know that, you know, looking at all these different options, now we just focus on one employer. What do I want coming out of this relationship? And then probably at different points within the employee life cycle um, throughout induction as well. So I would say, you know, from already onboarding, you want to mention it in the first week, maybe uh, potentially a month in as well, you know, what someone's feeling a little bit more settled in what their responsibilities are. And then probably again, at three or six months, whenever the probation period will be passed as well. Beyond that, I would say in terms of retention, you wanna remind people, um, you know, with LGBT people as well, you think, um, they may be part of the community or they may have come out during their time as an employee with you so that they may change their um, approach or their reaction to being part of a network or using a policy, for example. So it's important to let people know, uh, you know, throughout the employee life cycle. And also, if you've changed anything about your policies, you know, give people an update on any changes that have happened in your inclusion strategy as well. So in terms of recruitment, I would say. Uh, you know, throughout those stages that we've mentioned already, attraction, uh, interview and assessment process and onboarding, you want to mention it, if possible, that you have options for uh, diversity and inclusion support throughout, and then probably again at one month and three months or six months whenever the probation period would be over as well. Brilliant. Thank you so much, Beth. And I know you've spoken a little bit here about retention, which is something we said that we wanted to really talk about on this call as well. And you've mentioned the importance already of education and awareness, both within the organisational culture, but for line managers as well, and the importance of having the right policies and procedures in place that consider different um, different life uh, life narratives and, and different uh, communities, um, signals of support, like things like the pronouns. Um, I would love to ask, though, um, if we think further further down the employee journey with the company, especially considering the tenure of the average tech employee in the UK is not super high. Um, you know, we're going to be going through these processes where we're not just bringing people on and then hopefully they stay forever, but we want to make sure that they are 
they're getting really good farewell experiences as well so that they don't leave with a sour taste in their mouth of, of what it's been like to work with an employer so can we just look at that kind of um the kind of exits of of um employees from companies and and where are things going wrong there so there are two areas here one is offboarding <laughs> someone leaving for another job and then there's the if someone ends up retiring from a position from that company what haven't we thought about in that area because that's not something i hear about a lot with this uh, lgbtq plus inclusion in mind yeah yeah definitely so i mean in terms of offboarding in general i think it's good practice if possible to make it phased um, if it is a retirement situation, um, so, you know, not sort of going from, uh, you know, full five days a week, nine to five in the office to, to nothing but sort of phasing them out. And that's the same with uh, LGBT, you know, networks or involvement there as well. Um, and in terms of uh, offboarding people, it's really great to, to you know, sort of do that uh, exit interview and bring up this area of diversity and inclusion, um, you know, Unfortunately, if someone has had a negative experience, it may be here that we're hearing about those, um, you know, unfortunate instances that may have formed this negative experience. So if you are feeling a lack of employee voice, so you're not really sure what's happening, bringing up the question here and, you know, inviting people to, you know, share their experience, whether it's been negative or positive, you know, as you know, positive or negative as it can be, it's a really good source of information to understand what your current employees are experiencing as well. So I think in terms of offboarding, uh, want to make sure that, you know, obviously, like you say, the experience is as positive as possible, um, that the employee is leaving with a good experience of the company in case they do want to come back or in case you want to hire them again in the future, um, as can sometimes happen. But I think using it, you know, with exits as a form of, uh, I guess, it's sort of information gathering as well. People, you know, in some instances can tend to be more honest as they're exiting the company, you know, thinking that they have something else to go to, they're retiring, but that this may not cause so much of a stir if it is something that's new um, or something that, you know, they think can be improved upon in the organization as well. So I think that specific, um, you know, looking at LGBTQ plus identities, bringing up diversity and inclusion, did they feel included? Did they feel that their team was, um, you know, sort of uh, aware of the, the ways in which conclusion was important um, and looking at policy and procedures, did they feel supported not only by line manager HR, but by what was in writing in black and white with the company policy? Um, these sorts of things can, you know, be a, yeah, a good sort of information near the end of someone's uh, time as an employee. That's really helpful. Thank you, Beth, because uh, I don't often hear people who have that experience of, of speaking to that particular, ang particular angle. But um, let's let's assume this is uh, an, an employee that is a match made in heaven. They love working for you and they want to stay with you. Um, what types of other key moments, as well as something like an exit process, there are these other key career moments that folks will go through, both personal life moments, big transitions there, and then also professional ones as well. So when we're trying to specifically think about supporting LGBTQ plus folks through those moments, are there any particular considerations we need to bear in mind that might be different from say, you know, majority groups across, across the board? Where are these um, other areas of care we need to take when we're thinking about things like how folks are progressing through an organization or how they might manage big life changes um, where maybe they'd fall out of the workforce for some reason, or, you know, how do we help them stay with this particular lens in mind? Mm -hmm, definitely. So I think, um, I think in terms of, we'll start with the personal, um, there are a couple of big, you know, life uh, changes that we think of, and these can be, you know, just as big, but in a different way for LGBTQ plus people. Um, so for example, um, thinking about relationships, um, you know, if someone gets married, if they have a child, but also if they go through transition um, or if they change their pronouns or come out, those are different uh, considerations that need to be had. So I think in terms of policy and procedure around that, you want to make sure that your policies and support are accessible to everyone, make sure that everything is gender neutral. And like uh, like mentioned before, like see when we have these sort of embassy style um, uh you know, sort of policies and procedures across different regions, different countries, different offices, make sure that it is accessible to everyone, regardless of social or legalities, um, wherever anyone is, that everyone across your organization is having the same access to experience. And then around that, you also want to think about specific LGBTQ plus experiences that the majority of the population won't have. So thinking about uh, same-sex couples, healthcare, uh, family, 
transitioning, which can be a big one in terms of looking at the social, but also the legal, depending on where you are as well, um, and access to all the different resources and benefits as well around this. In terms of professional, when we think of progression, there's been um, a lot of data, unfortunately, to suggest that a lot of LGBTQ people don't believe they have the same opportunities to progress throughout organizations. Um, I found some data the other day looking from um, Involve, which is Diversity Inclusion Consultancy, saying that um, a third of the LGBTQ plus people that they sampled in their study believe that senior management would be more likely to promote people who weren't part of the community um, because they had more in common with them. Um, and that 28% of people from the community feel actively discriminated against in the promotion process. So these are, you know, really unfortunate numbers to see. And then, uh, you know, also there's uh, a lot of further in the study about having to code switch and having to try and fit in rather than finding that the that an organization is, is expansive and inclusive enough for, for everyone there. So I think, I guess a couple of things to consider when you think about promotion. Um, is that diversity a lot of the times, whether it's LGBTQ+, plus or in different areas, uh, a lot of the time can unfortunately end up sitting at the junior levels of the company and sort of slowly disappearing as you go up the ladder. And so it's really important to think about what people are adding when they go into different positions. And also, if you are looking to hire you know, diverse people in those senior roles where there may be less diversity, what is part of your talent attraction strategy that's going to bring someone into your organization more than going somewhere else? So in terms of this, it's really great to, I guess, try and create different pathways, you know, up the organizations for specific identities. So a great way to do this is to sort of tap into a network if you have one or any LGBTQ plus people who are happy to be vocal about this if you have that. Um, so thinking uh, specifically about collecting data from them, what's working, what's not, using that employee voice, um, surveys, focus groups to kind of get an idea of what's happening with your employees. And then beyond that, see if you can, you know, uh, integrate some sort of uh, initiatives around that. What I found works really well is, is mentoring in terms of, you know, a senior, uh, senior employer, mentoring a, a more junior employee to help with career progression and ideas around that, but then also reverse mentoring. So the information is flowing sort of in the opposite direction and the more junior employee who is a member of the LGBTQ plus community is mentoring the senior leader in what their experience is and how it's different for them versus um, someone who isn't part of the community. So that can work really well in an education and awareness setting, but also in sort of uh, helping the communication go two way. So even if, uh, you know, it may result in uh, a, a different type of conversation, as well as promotion throughout someone's uh, life and more understanding of, of what an individual goes through part of the community as well. Thanks, Beth. That's really helpful to have the understanding of the progression and some of the stats that you mentioned there are um, are quite um, sort of alarming there. Um, and I would like us to go on to um, our final question that we that we've prepared for today, um, which is one that kind of goes along uh, to to a slightly potentially more uncomfortable area, but one that we think a lot of employers are really tackling uh, tackling and and struggling with, and that is um, the how to navigate gender critical views in the workplace. Um, mm -hmm. So we've we've had a question um, for this session. It's something that we're hearing a lot. Um, th this query of how do you how do you navigate the fact that you know gender critical views are are out there, and we have obligations to protect folks in the LGBTQ plus community, but we also have responsibilities around protected philosophical beliefs. And um, this is a really sticky area that a lot of employers are really struggling to understand how to orient themselves and where the line should be. Um, so I would love to put this question to you. Um, around how we start to try and think about this in a way that we can act appropriately as employers. Yeah, yeah, definitely. This is actually um, a case with uh, the Maya Forstaff was a case which I studied during my during my degree. So um, it was something that was very prevalent in terms of, of my studies and, you know, since with my inclusion work around around pride and LGBTQ plus people. So gender critical views are uh, a protected belief um, and you can't take action against someone in a professional setting for having these views and you know outside of work uh, people are free to express them uh free of any sort of um you know uh, you know yes people can express them outside of work in the workplace when they are expressed however it is seen as something that creates a uh, both a toxic and hostile working environment for people who are protected under the Equality Act 2010, specifically around um, people being transgender, non-binary, under the, the category of gender reassignment, and uh, yes, gender reassignment specifically. 
So although people can express these in their personal time, expressing them in the workplace does constitute creating a toxic and hostile work environment and is in breach of the of the rights of transgender and non-binary people. Um, so although, yeah, you can't take action outside of work for this, but you can set uh, an expectation that these are harmful views for some members of uh, of you know of your um, employee base, and so they shouldn't be expressed in the workplace um, because this is unfair and actually in breach of other people's rights as well. Thanks, Beth. And it's such a it's such a complex issue because there are, there is so much grey area here, right? And that's that's one of the challenging things is that the case law is evolving. So even if we're looking at what's happened in recent years, it's so important for um, HR teams and people teams to make sure they are regularly checking the most recent case law to understand what is happening in these emerging grey areas around what's okay and what's not okay. Um, there's some fantastic examples on things like uh, CIPD and personnel development where they give you really good worked examples of where areas um, may come in contravention of the law and where areas are actually you know, not as straightforward. And one of the things that's really difficult about this area is that because it is it is evolving, it's something that we do have to keep a really close eye on to make sure that we are not um, falling foul of changes to the precedent that's out there. Um, so I would definitely encourage folks, um, if this is an area that, that's caused, um, caused some questions to arise, to have a look at some of the, the new case law that's out there, because it, we are, you know, as things are progressing, we're getting a clearer idea of what's okay and what's not okay and making sure that we are really um, wh where there's a, a truly deeply held authentic philosophical belief and not just an opinion that we're able to protect those alongside you know protecting folks in the LGBTQ plus community as well so um, that kind of takes us through all of the um, questions that we had from folks who registered for this call and we've done a, a whistle stop through um, attraction recruitment onboarding retention and progression um, with this kind of lens um, I always ask one final question um, to our signatory form guests about what they see uh, the future trajectory to look like for a particular issue area. So I would love to just get your thoughts, Beth, looking ahead for 2024, what are we expecting to see here and what are some final words of advice that you might have? Um, so I think in terms of looking at the future, um, we see that you know uh, a lot of people thinking about LGBTQ plus inclusion um, are thinking of younger generations, but people are coming out every day that are all different ages from different backgrounds, different intersectionalities as well. So I think it's um, a big focus coming up in terms of looking to the future and where your talent is going to be. And if you're not thinking about this, I think you should start very soon, very quickly, um, because it not only uh, it takes a while to sort of add this as a positive to your employer branding, but also to see uh, your employees and, you know, thinking about retention, have a voice in your organization to have a discourse around this. It takes a while to build that up. So it is a long term consideration. It should be part of your, your people and culture and recruitment strategy as soon as possible, if not already. And in terms of, of looking to the future as well, you know, unfortunately well alienating you know one part of the community alienates the rest of us as well as well as if you know when you think about lgbtq plus people they have loved ones and family who want to support them as well so in terms of being inclusive of them you're also giving you know a, a big sort of green flag in terms of interaction with an audience base beyond the community as well and so i think it's important to think not just about uh you know sort of the um, you know individual experiences but also who are you sort of speaking to and reaching out there with your inclusive uh, messaging as well. Um, as well as this, I think there's a lot around uh, the media right now that can be really hard to sort of figure out around LGBT inclusion. And I would sort of urge people to think about the, you know, the outlets that they're getting this from. If it's around an LGBTQ plus issue, uh, you know, where's the data to support the claims that are there? And also where is the voice from the community to make sure that it's, you know, from a reliable source. So I think education here is always a great thing. And like you said, it's important to be as up to date as, as possible and sort of integrate this into your day to day uh, learning and just understanding of, of employment in general. Brilliant. Thank you, Beth. Um, did you have any final words of advice for anyone here or are we? <laughs> Um, I think, uh, I mean, like I was just sort of saying, you know, education is always important. It's an area of learning that, you know, is never is never going to stop. And it's always going to be evolving. Um, it's a very joyous and loving place, you know, community and network to be a part of if you can, uh, you know, support your LGBTQ plus colleagues. 
um, loved ones, uh, friends, family, um, please do, you know, get more involved in the community if possible. Um, and don't be afraid to initiate conversation. You know, people are scared to make mistakes, but if you, um, you know, the tension, the intentions behind a lot of this is, is really very obvious to a lot of us. So if you make a mistake, it's fine to apologize and move on and keep being part of this conversation as well. Brilliant. Thank you so much, uh, Beth Papanen. Thanks so much for joining us and talking to us uh, about these uh, these topics today. Um, and we will put down some references below in the notes of any of the references that uh, that we highlighted in this in the signature forum. Thanks, folks.